I'm Ayush. I'll be speaking about mitigating SSRF at scale the right way uh, with IMDS V2. I'm a little under the weather, so pardon any sniffs and coughs in the middle. Uh, okay, so uh, as I just mentioned, I'm Ayush. I lead the data security and cloud security charters at uh, CRED. And in my past time, I contribute to CTFs and a bunch of other things, like speaking uh, slots and uh, whatnot. Let's just quickly start off with what is IMDS in the first place, right? So I'm pretty sure most of your orgs, if not all, will have some or the other cloud exposure. And EC2 is one of the most commonly used features or services present in AWS, right? Uh, across all cloud providers, there's a thing called instance metadata endpoint, which is a locally exposed endpoint uh, available from within the instance, which you can query to get a bit of information readily available from within the instance, right? So uh, in AWS specifically, you can query that information uh, like region, the instance ID, the IAM credentials as well that are present within the instance that are exposed to it via IAM roles and so on, uh, so on and so forth, right? The endpoint is essentially of the form 169.254.169.254, right? And it's available across most cloud providers, if not all, right? So uh, it, it's just a handy way to like have some information readily available that you do not have to put in additional controls, permissions, and so on and so forth to fetch information, right? For example, let's say your uh, application has a custom logging library that you append the host IP to, for example. To fetch that host IP from an instance, now you'll have to add some credentials, fetch it from AWS console or CLI or something, right? But it, because it's readily available, now you can just do a curl request, fetch that IP and append it to your, or expose it as an environment variable, right? So it's just, uh, reduces the number of permissions, additional things that you have to do to work with it. So looks like a cool utility, but uh, what's the problem with it, right? So notoriously, it also stores the IAM credentials that are given to a EC2 instance, right? Via an IAM instance profile role. Uh, why this is a bad thing? is because IMDS V1 allows unauthenticated access. So if you're within the instance, let's say via SSH or some other means, or SSRF, for example, you can query that endpoint without any authentication. So let's say your, uh, your application that's running on the instance allows for SSRF, or uh, let's say some other kinds of issues where you can query a URL from within the application itself, right? You can query the endpoint without any authentication, fetch the credentials back, and because they are CLI compatible or even BOTO3 compatible SDKs, right? You can expose them locally on your system and then work with them as, I mean, without even having to like have any further interaction with the instance. Now you have the credentials with you on your laptop. You can enumerate permissions from there and basically do anything that you're supposed, you can do with that. Let's say privilege escalation and so on and so forth, right? So it gives rise to a bunch of different attack vectors, uh, not just SSRF, right? Uh, open WAFs, reverse proxies. I'll show you a quick demo of how it looks like reverse pro uh, with working with reverse proxies as well. Uh, okay. But before that, uh, let's giving a brief about SSRF. I'm pretty sure most of you know what an SSRF attack is. But uh, a TLDR of it is basically when uh, there's an application in which you can make a payload in, in a certain way where the application will make a call on your behalf or a request on your behalf, right? So it's essentially like, for example, uh, uh, layman's example is like, if I want to query Google for some, something, right? I can send that request in a specific payload format to a, an application and it will actually query the data, fetch the result and give it back to me. This is what like a basic overview of SSRF looks like, right? So by that same logic, now I can use an SSRF bug to hit the IMDS endpoint from within the instance, right? And then again, because it's a, just a path thing, which is also fixed, you don't even have to like guess that path. Uh, in that path, you can fetch the credentials back to yourself, and then again, expose them locally on your system by environment variables, hard code them, scripts, whatever, and then go from there, right? So here's a quick demo of how it looks like when we're talking about uh, reverse proxies, right? So on the top, you actually have the instance, right? Uh, here's the uh, metadata endpoint. It's this response that is relevant. And below, you can see I'm actually just querying the actual IP, the internal IP, right? But I'm changing the host header. What happened above was I just started an Nginx server. And by uh, replacing the host header, basically, when I'm sending that request to uh, Nginx, it replaces 
makes the request on my behalf to the IMDS v, uh, v1 endpoint and then fetches the result back, which is the same as the one that you see above, right? Code success, profile ID, and everything. So I'm assuming most of you would now agree that there are issues with IMDS, right? So what can you do about it? It's as simple as switching to IMDS v2, right? So in AWS, IMDS endpoint essentially comes in like two flavors, v1 and v2. v1 is what we just talked about. v2 makes a very subtle small change wherein you have to fetch a header token, right? Which uh, needs to be done via uh, the put HTTP verb. And post any uh, post fetching that token, any request that goes forward from there has to have that token in the header, right? As a part of authentication. Now, it seems like a very simple change, and it is, to be very honest. But uh, the uh, well, how it defeats a lot of things or the entire class of SSRF bugs is now the fact that uh, in an SSRF you are unable most of the times unable to control the HTTP verb, right? So you can't make a get request. Sorry, uh, you can't make a put request, or you can't change the get request to now a put request post request or whatever, right? And because of that, you'll never be able to fetch the token and nor uh, add another header basically with the token, right? So you can't, you can make a query, but it will just not work. So how do you switch to IMDS v2? Again, it's a very super simple thing. Uh, the screenshot basically shows how you can like select the right configuration. You have to go to the advanced session section uh, while launching an EC2 instance. Uh, and then just select metadata version to uh, v2 only, which is token required, and you're pretty much done, right? You're enforcing v2, and the right side shows how you can mod modify an existing EC2 instance with, a, a, with, the a, with an AWS CLI command, right? So seems super simple, but uh, it's simple and it's not as well, because typically when we're talking about uh, large organizations, right, they have huge scales, like hundreds if not thousands of instances that exist, right? And running all kinds of workloads, some containerized, some not, some running different things, different regions, right? All sorts of things. So uh, when we were doing this at CRED internally, we had a bunch of stages that we went through basically to identify how or what's the best way to actually go forward with this migration because we have a lot of instances running and all of our production accounts have instances along with like different kinds of workloads, some on EKS, some run Kubernetes, some containers and whatnot, right? So all kinds of different flavors. So we came up with like a plan of action basically, which I'll just go, go through next. So the first step uh, was basically to planning uh, for planning and scoping, right? So certain accounts you might not want to get into the context of this migration. For example, your developer account. You want to keep it super low friction for developers and other engineers to try out new things, services, write code, go crazy basically. And typically it's segregated from your production environments anyways, so it's a separate thing. You can probably scope out those accounts that you don't want to be part of the migration. Um, another thing is, let's say uh, there are certain regions which contain different kinds of workload. You want to exclude them, or certain regions that you only want to ta tackle, right? Or if you just gonna uh, want to like blindly go crazy and like uh, migrate all of your regions. So this planning stage is fairly simple. It's an ideation phase where you work with, let's say, your SRE, DevOps, or operations teams, and figure out what is your infrastructure looking like. Specifically, talking about EC2, right? And uh, how do you go about doing like this migration? What, what will be in scope when you go on and do this? The next step is gaining visibility, right? You don't want to randomly migrate stuff because it just might break things, right? Uh, if uh, any proper engineer would want to have some proof that, hey, what I'm doing will not break stuff, right? So to AWS's credit, uh, they actually came up with a metric called metadata no token, right? It specifically was built by AWS to facilitate migration from IMDS v1 to v2 because what this allows you to do is just go to the CloudWatch uh, dashboard uh, and it will show like a tick uptake of instances uh, that are actually making call to the IMDS v1 endpoint, right? So you can migrate, for example, if you go to the dashboard and there is no instance that is making this call, hence no metric traffic here. You can just go ahead and like uh, simply migrate all of your instances because nothing is calling that endpoint and hence nothing would break if you do it, right? But uh, the question comes in if there are instances that actually do this, right? Are making an explicit call to the MDS v1 endpoint, then you have something to worry about because then you need to figure out what is that process, application, or code that's making that call 
and you have to make certain changes uh, depending upon what kind of code it is, right? So, and there's a bunch of caveats also, right? One fun thing, actually two of the fun things that we kind of found when we were working with uh, uh, services at CRED, that there are like two major segregations that you can do uh, for services, compute services specifically. Most of your AWS infra runs in one or the other form uh, under EC2, right? Sometimes you basically have access to that instance, sometimes you don't, right? So EC2 itself, and then EC, EC2 based services, where you use EC2 networking with, let's say, EKS and ECS, you get access to these instances as well, right? So migrating them will differ from LightSail and SageMaker, which are other types of compute resources, but they do not fall under EC2, right? So let's say you write a script that basically goes and migrates all of your EC2 uh, instances, it will still fall short if you if your org if your team basically uses a light sail server or a SageMaker notebook because while they have IMDS v1 and v2 versions enabled, uh, they do not fall under the EC2 category. You don't actually get access to the instance underlying that, right? It doesn't show up in your EC2 dashboard. And there are other service-based caveats also. So auto scaling actually works with EC2, but it's like an abstraction layer on top of EC2, right? You don't, uh, again, uh, the difference is, for example, you migrate all of the instances that were part of a auto scaling fleet, but uh, let's say when an instance refresh hits the launch template because it still contains V1 uh, configuration, the new instances will still come up with V1, which again is a problem, right? So uh, these were the two like major ones, and then because we use ECS heavily at CRED, we also figured out there's a hop limit issue. So just migrating to V2 would actually break your container workloads if they're trying to make an explicit call uh, to the IMDS V1 endpoint, because there's a hop limit uh, uh, limitation. By default, it's set to one, so while your container can send that request, the response would never actually reach back to the container, hence it will not be able to fetch or even make a, uh, I mean, like get any response back, right? So now that you've scoped out your accounts, you've figured out caveats, you've done a bunch of uh, handiwork on how to go and do, it, do this migrate, uh, migration, right? So uh, what's the next step? The first and foremost is to like, uh, after you've figured out that, hey, there are certain processes that are making explicit calls to the MDS V1 endpoint, you have to update those code and scripts, basically. Uh, and when I say explicit, I basically mean, let's say, a curl request to the 169.254 endpoint directly, right? Because the good thing is AWS CLI and all of your AWS SDKs, the latest versions of them, uh, actually support IMDS v2 out of the box. So if you are using an application, your application uses, let's say, Boto3, you don't have to make any migration changes there. It's only for explicit calls that you have to, like, literally add one line which fetches the token, and then add a header for any consecutive calls that you make to the endpoint, right? And it just works. And for actually migrating your instances, there are two configurations that you, I sh uh, you should ideally put. One is the HTTP tokens required instead of optional, and uh, metadata response hop limit to two to facilitate any container workloads that might be running within your EC2 instances. And uh, the screenshots are basically the difference of how it looks like uh, when you switch to IMD V2, right? It's basically a one-liner difference. So as you can see, uh, it's like a, a token that you kind of fetch from the endpoint, right, with a put request, and then any subsequent call, which is the same as the one on top, but you just add a header with that token. So uh, I'll just show you a quick demo of the hop limit issue as well. So right now we are within the instance, right? Uh, and we can fetch something with the token. This is V2, right? As you can see, now I get inside a container and basically make the same call. But uh, as you'll see, it, it's basically stuck there. It's not doing anything, right? Uh, no response is coming back because again, this is a hop limit uh, limitation. So what I'll do is I'll just update the metadata configuration again to now with hop limit two, right? And after running this, so hop limit is set to two. I'll just uh, rerun the above command, and now it would work. Simple stuff, right? So now you have migrated, done a bunch of things, automation, planning, everything, visualization, right? 
but uh, it still would fall short if you don't think slightly ahead uh, and talk about the future as well. Because uh, let's say you did the hard work of actually migrating across all your accounts, environment, service, taking into consideration all sorts of caveats, but there's a, uh, another person who randomly just launches a new server with IMDs V1. So your entire migration goes for a toss, right? So uh, what you need to do from this point forward post your migration is to actually put in controls that stops or prevents this from happening in the first place. Uh, you can do this in multiple ways. There are some low friction ways, there are high friction ways. Uh, a high friction way is basically to stop creation of any instance which uh, does not conform to the MDS v2 configuration, right? So you can use something called EC2 metadata HTTP tokens as a condition block in your SCP or IAM based policy. And if it's not set to required, you can just deny the creation of the run instance event, which is what happens when you launch an instance. Or you can use a low friction one, which is this EC2 role delivery thing, which is set to 2.0. What this basically does is it allows you to launch instances. It allows even you to fetch credentials from the IMDs V1 endpoint, right? The funny thing is that uh, when you try to use those credentials, it will not let you. It will give you an access denied error. Even if your instance profile, let's say, had a permission, but if you fetch it from the IMDs V1 endpoint, it will not. It will just give you an access denied error because of this policy. Again, you can apply it via an SCP or IAM, uh, IAM based policy, right? And going forward, you should monitor for any changes to the same thing as well. So AWS Config is a native tool, but you can use something else as well, custom automation, scripts, whatever, for detection of any new resource that might come up with IMDs V1, so any traffic that would come that, uh, there. So you'll at least be aware of the changes in your infrastructure, ki, hey, there's a new thing coming up, right? And uh, again, credit to AWS. Amazon Linux 3, which is the new newest version of AL uh, AMIs, basically, defaults to IMDS v2. So if you just make us like it's a bit of a change to be pushed uh, through the org, but if you can do it, get your org to switch to uh, AL 3, uh, you you're done with that as well. Like because your org now will by default work with IMDS v2, right? But yeah, of course, there's like five stages we just talked about. It might even be boring that, hey, I, I don't want to like do this much work. I have to write my code and whatnot, right? This must be a solved problem. I wish there was a simpler way. So uh, we kind of felt the same way. And we had cred also like solving a lot of problems ourselves, right? Instead of like buying tools and all. So we actually wrote a tool for ourselves, uh, which is called IMD Shift. It's uh, automation from end to end, everything that we just talked about. You just have to plan out what accounts you want to migrate, what resources, and what regions, and we take care of the rest, right? Uh, features include from like basically just everything we talked about. So it includes all the caveats that we also talked about, right? So you can uh, not only uh, migrate EC2 resources, you can selectively choose to migrate, let's say, EC2 resources that are only associated with EKS, right? or LightSail or SageMaker as well, which there is another tool called Meta Badger by Salesforce, uh, which was previously existing, but at this point it only supports EC2, right? So we wanted our iterative development to be a significant improvement from that. Uh, hence, we support all resources that come under any kind of compute, basically, which can, uh, has the IMDs configuration, right? Uh, you can choose services, you can choose reasons, of course. We also have the built-in visibility module, so you don't even have to log on to your AWS console. You can just run the uh, appropriate command to fetch like what all instances are working with IMDS v1 explicitly, and it will fetch the metrics from CloudWatch for you, and then just showcase to you the instance list and the regions, basically, and you're done. And uh, because writing SCPs is a tricky business, right? Uh, you don't want to do stuff that can break your entire org, right? Because SCP is typically applied at the org level. So we have also written a lot of SCP recommendations built into the uh, tool itself, where you can just like query, pick the one that fits best for you. Could be IAM, could be SCP, uh, could be high friction, could be low friction. We've given a bit of a disclaimer as, as well. You can just copy paste, put it into your org SCP and be rest assured that it'll work fine because we have tried and tested it. So IMD shift is under active development, which basically means I sometimes code or, uh, about it in the weekend when I'm free. But uh, feel free to like uh, contribute. Uh, I'd be happy to like uh, talk with any one of you who wants to like come uh, talk about the tool or like cloud or data security in general. Uh, you can find me running around the conference. Like I, I'm just like going on meeting people. So yeah, 
that's all uh, from me. Uh, if you folks have any questions, I can take them now, or again, you can just reach out to me after this talk around the conference as well. And you can reach out to me on these handles. Thanks. Thanks, folks.